Hey, what's up? We're on location. We're going to be talking about mixing the live action element. It's a little windy out here. Do you want to try to get the dirt maybe come on this side so that all the stuff flies over this way? Yeah, sure. Hello. Do you think that this dirt's going to hit the camera? Should we... Well, maybe we should do this behind the building so um, the wind won't be a problem. Hey, what's up? Andrew Kramer here and welcome to another very exciting tutorial. Today, we're going to be creating an exciting shockwave blast that uh, hopefully you can scare your friends with. Uh, let's take a look. A little outtake here. Hmm. Man, what just happened? That's so unexpected. Um, all I have to say is if somebody says, hey, look at this kitten video and turn up your speakers, be ready for some demon to like jump out and uh, get you. So watch out. People are always trying to trick you. You're looking at a car commercial, car's going, all of a sudden demon comes out and uh, gets you. So um, now if we take a look at this explosion, you can actually see uh, the dirt starts getting kicked up and then it blasts out and the oxygen gets it and all of a sudden, you know, shock waves are, are going. Now, this particular shot is a real explosion, so we're gonna be trying to create one that's similar. Now, here I have some footage. We actually reshot it exactly the same way without the explosion, just so that we could do the effects on it, obviously. And um, I was actually debating on whether or not to make a tutorial out of this because you know, we have some different tutorials for motion tracking and compositing elements. And I thought, well, you know, you could pretty much figure things out. But I actually had a lot of interesting challenges um, that I had to figure out while doing this. And I thought, you know, alone, those those interesting things could be very valuable to uh, to people who run into similar problems. What's important about learning After Effects is understanding these little techniques and these problem solving tools that will help you get your work done. Um, you're not always gonna be working on a shot that is exactly the way that you learned it. You know, you're gonna be throwing a curveball. you're gonna run into these issues that uh, need to be solved before you can move on to that next step in your mind. So. Um, that's why I actually think this is going to be uh, really interesting um, because we have a lot of motion blur which made um, you know motion tracking a little bit tricky and then uh, a few other interesting little things that uh, I actually figured out along the way. So here it is now, um, the shockwave tutorial or whatever it's called. And by the way, look at that action face. Sam Loy is rolling over in his grave right now if you ask me. Just kidding. He's not dead yet. Um, all right, so we're gonna take this shot and drop it into a new comp. So the first thing I would do here is I would motion track it. So I would say, all right, track motion. I wanna track the rotation. And then I would uh, I would try to track this. Say, all right, maybe this and uh, maybe even the side of the building here. And we would track forward. And, you know, it would get thrown off and that's okay. We can go back and try to adjust it. but. The problem is when this motion blur gets going, I mean, there is just nothing to track. So we would have to do some hand tracking. We'd have to move the points and uh, it could be done, but it would be a lot of work. So luckily in After Effects CS4 and CS5, it comes with this really cool tool called the Mocha AE Tracker. And what we can do is export our shot, open it up in Mocha, do a track, and then bring that information back into After Effects. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna choose Composition, Add to Render Queue, and I'm gonna render it out. And I'm probably just gonna render it into a JPEG sequence. And uh, we'll hit OK, and we'll set a destination for it. And then we'll just click Render. So here's Mocha, and this is the CS4 version. Um, CS5 version has a few slight changes, but the important thing to remember is when you import your footage, I'm gonna click here, and uh, grab that sequence, and I'll open it here. And uh, we'll click Next, it's fine. And what we wanna do is make sure that everything's set up correctly. So as we go through here, we wanna make sure our frame rate is the same as our comp and After Effects. In this case, 23.976. And by the way, if you just go to your composition settings, you can find out what that frame rate is. You wanna make sure that that is exact. So that's good, we'll hit finish, 
and it'll cache the frames up here. Um, I can't actually get the whole thing in here, so I'll be sliding it back and forth. Um, but I can scrub through my footage here, and then we can create a tracking area. Now, um, Mocha uses a little bit of different method than point tracking. It uses what's called planner tracking. And it's more like tracking an area or a texture rather than a specific point. So it'll work actually really well for this shot. So if we take the uh, X-Pline here, we're just gonna make a shape. You know, I wanna get enough of this in here so that when the shot uh, you know, moves around, it uh, will work. So as you draw it, right click to, you know, close the shape. Right here, I'm tracking part of my head, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but there's enough of the area selected that I should hopefully be excluded from uh, the tracking result. So once we get it set up, we'll come down here and we'll click the track forward button. Now one of the things you want to pay attention to is that the area that you're trying to track stays within this shape region. So just keep an eye on it. And even though we have all this motion blur, our shape is doing a really good job of following it. So right here, my head seems to be affecting the track. So why don't we go back a little bit here and I'll adjust the point. And then just go ahead and track forward again. All right, so our tracking is done and we can scrub through it and see we actually have a pretty good track considering it's such a blurry, shaky shot. Now, what I wanna do is drag this back to the very beginning and click on this button here called Align to Surface. So what that's gonna do is lock the corner pin data or the tracking data to this particular frame or the very first frame of our shot. And then I'm gonna go ahead and take the program, slide it over here just a little bit, and click Export Tracking Data. And it creates a bunch of tracking data, and the way it works is you simply click Copy to Clipboard, and then we'll come back in After Effects and create a new solid. And this will be our tracking holder. And we hit OK, and then make sure to go to the beginning or when you began tracking the shot, and we choose Edit Paste. And what that does is paste a bunch of keyframes. So if I hit U, we have a bunch of keyframes for this corner pin effect. So it sort of created a four pin uh, perspective corner pin for the tracking area that we selected. Now, it's not very useful unless we do layer, pre-compose, choose leave all the attributes, and hit OK. And then what we can do is open that comp up by double clicking on it and maybe drop an explosion into the frame real quick. Let's see. So when we put that explosion in this comp and we go back to comp two, we can actually see that we have the explosion tracked into the shot. And uh, that works pretty well. Now, one of the problems with a corner pin method of uh, tracking is that, one, we can't turn motion blur on this because corner pin doesn't actually have motion blur. So we can't just turn it on for the layer. Um, that actually won't work. And another problem with a shot like this is if the camera moves too much, you can see that my explosion gets cut off even though you know my explosion exists beyond that uh, edge of the frame. So it kind of is a bit of a problem using corner pin data for a wide shot like this where we want elements to exist all outside of the frame because of the camera movement. So what would be nice is if we had a null object like we would get from the After Effects camera tracker. So the cool thing is there's a way to extract it and there's actually some expressions and even some scripts that will, will do it. But I wanna show you just kind of a nuts and bolts method of extracting the tracking data without having to, uh, you know, get into uh, messing around with expressions, even though I would recommend it if you, you know, if this is a workflow that you plan on using. But this would be a good way to illustrate uh, what we're doing. So, so instead, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to Mocha, choose Export Tracking Data, select After Effects Transform Data, copy to clipboard, and then we're gonna create a null object 
go to the beginning of the clip and choose edit paste. Now it comes in kind of strange, so hit U. We're gonna shut the scale off. We're gonna grab the anchor point, select the name, choose copy, grab the position, choose edit, paste, and then uncheck the anchor point so that we've just swapped the anchor point and the position essentially. And now we've got uh, our tracking marker here. We can also change the anchor point to say zero, zero. And this should just give us a good tracking point. All right, so we're gonna be using the Action Essentials 2 collection, which is our stock footage of explosions and dirt and dust and fire. And um, hopefully we can talk about some of the best ways to composite these. You know, sometimes you see explosions simply screened or add onto a shot, but you really want to think about what the element is and what the best way to um, blend it with your background. So let's jump right in. I've imported a few select clips for this particular shot. And uh, first off, we have uh, this dirt charge, which is this really cool explosion with little bits. And then we have another one, which is a little bit more sandy that has like almost like compacted dirt that shoots up. So we're gonna bring those out into our comp. So I'll grab dirt charge number 20 and number 19. We'll drop them in. So if we look at this, we can see our explosion, but it's not linked to our tracking data. It's just kind of sitting there. So what we could do is take our two clips, parent them to our tracking data, and um, then we could scrub through and it would be tracked to our shot. However, what I like to do for shots like this is I actually like to create a separate null object, specifically for things like explosions, and here we have the tracking data. And what we'll do is we'll take the two elements and we'll parent them to the explosion, and then we'll take the explosion and we'll parent it to the tracking data. So what this allows us to do now is scale up all of the elements related to the explosion and move it around and reposition it without having to worry about messing up uh, our tracking data. So it's actually really convenient to, to work this way and uh, I recommend it. So here we go. So first thing we're gonna do is take a look at this sandy compacted dirt and I'm probably gonna speed it up. So here's what we can do. We can choose layer, time, time stretch, and we'll set this to something like 75. And we'll scroll through here, we'll scrub in, and I want this to start going up before the reaction. So right about here, we're gonna start seeing this underground charge. And then once it gets a little bit bigger, then we want our larger explosion to turn on. So we don't want to see this fire too much. We want to see it about here, and uh, maybe we'll scale it down just a little bit. Another thing I like to do is change the anchor point of explosions to the area where it explodes, so that if we scale it up, it'll scale up from uh, the blast area. So we'll actually probably put the dirt charge below the compacted dirt, and we'll trim the clip. We can do that Alt, Begin Bracket, or just drag the end of it inward. And likewise, we'll take the number 19, the compacted dirt, and trim that also. So here we have the dirt going up, and then might even speed this up by moving it over, and then it blows up. Now we're gonna have to do a few things like adding some glows and things like that to get that to blend nicely, but you know the idea is that the dirt gets lifted and then the pressure of it actually explodes and then all the pieces go flying. So that should work pretty good. Now the other thing we wanna do is color correct it to match our shot. So we'll choose effect, uh, maybe add a tint, and then a curves adjustment, common, common things. And we'll just bring that tint down a little bit. We just want this to melt with our background. So as we adjust this, um, looks like there's a little bit too much green, so we'll go to the green channel and we'll just lower this down a bit. Um, another thing we can do is add a mask to the bottom here. If we look at the clip. We can just trim the bottom, we'll set it to subtract and then feather it out a little bit. So you can hit M to bring up the mask properties or F to bring up uh, the feather properties and that'll just help it blend with the background a little nicer. Also, Control-Shift-H 
hides all of the handles and masks and everything in your shot, so that's good. You can also just use the hide uh, masks here, but, but sometimes you just wanna hide everything, so Control shift h is good. So we'll turn on our other dirt charge here, and it has a bunch of stuff here that we're probably gonna cut out, so let's take the pen tool and let's cut some of the bottom of this off. So again, we'll uh, set it to subtract, hit F, and uh, we'll just feather it just a touch. And then we'll color correct it. So we'll just add a curve adjustment. Now, it's a little bit contrasted, so we'll bring up the black point here so it's not too dark. And then we'll try to match it, maybe add a little bit of red, take away uh, the blue a little bit there. And, uh, you know, that looks pretty good. Let's see, we'll scrub through here. Um, our dirt charge, we might scale that down a little bit. And again, I like to take that anchor point and put it down at the blast point, and that way we can scale things down. Slide this out so it's like a bigger. Okay, so just moving things around, just trying to get it to line up a little nicer. And uh, I think that looks nice. So, bam, blows up. And already it's, it's looking pretty good, but let's add in some more elements. Oh, and by the way, check this out. Now that we have the null object, an actual um, you know, spatial movement, we can turn on the motion blur. So if we turn the motion blur on for our two elements and for our comp, you can see now we actually have nice uh, motion blur for, for our elements. So if we turn that on and off, you can kind of see how that works. So that really helps uh, you know, blend the elements and also hide some of the you know, imperfections. Not that there would ever be imperfections in visual effects because our job is to be perfect but they just work us so late, you know, and I just get so, f anyway, uh, moving on, um, we have some other great elements, these dust wave elements. So if we take a look, it's these, um, so we'll come back in here, I'll take my dust wave, drop it in here, and these are elements are all pre-keyed, so we just drop them in there, we can instantly start to see, um, you know, how things are looking. Now I'm gonna scale this one down, parent it to our explosion, and uh, probably add, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and add a mask around the, uh, the main area here, and then feather it. So that way it uh, blends nicely. Now, the thing about dust is we could change the transfer mode to you know screen, but it, it starts getting a little bit too bright. We actually wanna keep it at normal and simply color correct it so it matches the dust that would probably exist in the scene, so it'd be a little darker. So we'll choose, uh, you know, we could tint it. That might be a simple way. Um, we can grab some of the color from the scene and uh, maybe adjust it to get it what we want. Okay, now we can also change the opacity, so we can lower it, but remember, if dust fills up the frame, it can actually block the view of stuff, so that's why we wanna keep it at normal for this particular shot, because it is sort of obscuring um, some of the, uh, the dirt on the ground here, so. That is looking pretty good. Probably want this to be a little bit warmer. All right, so I'm gonna lower the opacity here just a touch, so you can see through it just a little bit. And I'm probably gonna take another copy of the dust, duplicate it, and scale this up a lot. So we want the dust, and, and the other thing too, is I'm gonna offset the time. So the first dust comes out of the initial blast, and then the second one comes a little bit later as the, you know, 
dirt and uh, debris starts getting kicked up. So move that one down. Really, we could scale this thing up really large. Just offset it there. Um, and tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll, t I'll set it to screen just, just temporarily so that you can kind of see um, what it looks like in terms of uh, the size and what it's doing. But then we want to lower it down so that it blends in with our shot nicer. So it's got a cool little effect and you know we could probably offset the timing of this so that it seems like a much more succinct kind of explosion and, and the blast and the energy all escapes you know in the beginning there. So, but like I said, we want to go ahead and switch that back. We want it to blend nicely. You know, sometimes people run into this problem in compositing. They really want to make sure their effects get noticed. And so they exaggerate them or, you know, they make them over the top. And unfortunately, it does the opposite effect. It actually makes us recognize and say, oh, wow, that's not real. Um, and it's funny how doing something and making it as seamless and as invisible as possible actually gets the, the, the more intense reaction to it. So, you know, you can keep, keep that in mind. Uh, moving on. So we have some other um, dust elements that are really cool um, that I'll probably work in here towards the end. We want the whole frame to just be full of dust. So let's copy this tint and paste it to this new tint here and maybe make this one a little bit brighter. And let's offset this, uh, let's see. So what's cool is the camera comes over here and it pans over to the right. And that's when I wanna kind of introduce this. So we don't actually see it coming and getting us, but it'll just sort of be there. We'll scale it up nicely and uh, maybe even fade it in so that we don't see it just uh, all of a sudden appearing. Let's see, what can we do with this particular? Dust. We'll parent it to the uh, explosion there, and we probably should add a mask to uh, you know hide any of the hard, sharp edges. So we'll uh, feather that out just a little bit. So let's take a look at just our elements without our uh, our action star in there. And by action star, I mean uh, you know hobo. All right. So that last one, it looks like it comes on a little bit abruptly, which might be okay once we get the shockwave in um, in the next couple of steps, but we might just slide it over and just make the fade in a little bit slower so that it seems like it's traveled um, a further distance. So it's kind of interesting to look at it like this because we can see things like this sharp edge right here and, and we might uh, you know, find that element and just feather it out a little bit more or adjust the mask so that you know, it doesn't get chopped off as much. Now, this actually brings up another, um, another idea, and that is to have a lot of elements going at the same time. So remember, we used that dirt, that compacted dirt. Well, let's duplicate that, take a second copy of it, put it behind the, uh, the first charge, um, we'll put it behind number 20 here with all of the debris and slide it in there. And this way, it actually looks like an even more impressive explosion because we have all this sand and, and dust being kicked up as well. Um, we want to be careful about the sharp edge here, so let's go ahead and add a quick mask. Let's see. And we'll set it to subtract and we'll feather it out. So that uh, just kind of helps blend it in. And if we look at it in the actual composite, we should be in pretty good shape. One of the keys is just hiding any kind of, um, you know, geometric kind of shapes. You don't want any sharp edges that your eye can kind of focus on. And as long as you keep it, you know, fairly soft on those types of elements, you know, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to pick up on it. Now we have another problem. We have to obscure myself and so that I'm in front of all of that debris, but we can talk about that um, in a little bit. I would probably just say, let's feather this ground mask a little bit more. Um, and you can actually, in addition to feathering, you can also change the expansion of the mask. So grow it or shrink it um, to, to get it just right. 
And uh, let's come back over here to the project. Let's see what else we can composite in with this massive explosion. Let's say we want to get some fire. So we actually have this really big explosion and uh, we can come in here. Let's find the beginning of the explosion. I want to see some of the dirt sh shoot up like that and then have the explosion come on uh, you know, right after that. So let's move this explosion up into place here. And then it, uh, then it blows up. Now for this explosion, I am going to set it to screen. And usually when I set it to screen, I like to put some smoke behind it. And in this case, we have this amazing um, dark smoke element. Um, I have to give credit to Speed Breaker, who uh, you know we hired to develop the simulation. Um, it's just so hard to film, you know, elements that have such a large um, scope, you know, without being arrested. And in this case. Um, you know the simulation just looks so good. Um, it was a it was a cool element to include. So we'll drop that into our scene, and it's really slow. So it's nice for making things look really large. In this case, um, let's speed it up. So we'll choose time, uh, time stretch, and maybe we'll set it to about 50 percent, and uh, we'll stick it behind all of this explosion stuff. And actually, I don't even want it to be black. I want it to be more smoke dusty. So we'll tint it. Um, use some of the scene color, desaturate it a little bit, make it a little darker. And then we'll feather off the bottom here, subtract it, and then turn the feathering up. So it's nice and uh, smooth. So it's all the same kind of stuff, you know, I had a little mask here, so it blends nicely. Um, you know, sometimes I just throw everything together and don't worry about smoothing it out until I get the feeling right, the motion, like you like the size of the explosion, and then you can go in and, and refine it. Luckily, I'm pretty sure the elements I used already, um, oh, I mean, never mind. Like I said, that explosion shot from the beginning, that was real. So I will uh, stop trying to contend otherwise. Um, so we'll move this explosion up here. Let's check the timing of this. Now our, our, dar our dark smoke comes on a little too soon. So let's see if we can change the timing of that. All right, so that looks a little nicer. Let's create a new solid and we'll make it kind of a golden color and uh, we'll hit OK here. And let's set the transfer mode to add. And that way you get this really bright effect. Let's create uh, an ellipse really quick, maybe right uh, right here, scale it up or feather it up. And uh, we actually want to parent this to the explosion also, but we want to be careful and make sure it's large enough so that it uh, doesn't get cut off. So we'll scale this down a bit. All right. And then we'll hit T and we want to fade this thing on. So this big glow element is something we want to pop on at the very beginning of the explosion. So we'll set this down to zero and then we'll fade this up as the explosion gets large and then as it gets faded out, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do that also. Now let's go ahead and take a look at where things are at the moment. And uh, also, let's make sure that we parent our explosion to our explosion. Tracking data there. And as we check, let's make sure the dark smoke is also parented to our explosion also. So when you bring out the new elements, just make sure you link them up. And uh, let's take a look um, at uh, where things are. All right, so that's pretty good. Um, you know, there's a few things I, that we should probably tweak as far as the dust, and that's what this is all about. You want to go in there and you know move things around and uh, just get the composite to to look right, and uh, and that's what's going to make the shot better. All right, so let's go and create a shock wave. So I'm going to create a new solid, and we're going to make it about a thousand by a thousand, and uh, we'll hit OK. Then we're going to add an ellipse. So we'll just click in the middle here, hold down Control Shift, and uh, then we'll hit F, and we're going to feather it just a touch. 
and then we'll make it a 3D layer, hit F4 there, 3D layer, and we're gonna rotate it so that it's on its side. And the idea is simply to scale it from being really low, so we'll set a keyframe there, click on the stopwatch, we'll move forward a little bit, and um, we'll scale it up nice and large so it just fills the frame rather quickly. And then we'll parent this to our explosion. And the other thing we want to do, I'll spread that out just a little bit. And the other thing we want to do is add a, you know, like a clipping mask or a track mat. So we'll add a solid, um, actually we'll make it uh, comp size. And we want to just mask out the top half here. And if we turn on our footage, the idea is to limit the distance that the shockwave can travel. So we'll just go to about right here, feather it a little bit. And if we take our shockwave, um, we can set the switch to track uh, the alpha invert of the layer above. So if I move this top layer, I can kind of obscure parts of the mask. And what that helps is as that shockwave goes off into the distance, it won't, um, you know, go on forever and create like a, you know, a sharp edge at the at the end of it. So it'll it'll blend nicely. So if we lower the opacity of our shockwave, we'll set it to screen, and we'll lower the opacity. It looks pretty good, but we want the timing of it to be a little bit more dynamic. So if we select the two keyframes, we can right click on them, or better yet, go to animation. Uh, keyframe assistant and choose exponential scale. And what that does is creates a keyframe for every frame so that the animation is no longer linear but exponential um, like, a, like a 3D layer would be if it was traveling towards you. It basically just makes it look like it's traveling at the same speed rather than really fast and then really slow. So if we take that off. Now we want the shock wave to actually be beneath everything and um, we probably just want to time it, maybe move it over a little bit. Here, let's see. I'll take uh, the shockwave, we'll put it right about here. And then our clip mask, actually we should probably make it a little bit larger so that as the camera moves, it will uh, stay visible. So half res. All right, first let's uh, clip the shockwave so that it starts at the beginning of the keyframe, so right about there. Take a look. It's pretty light colored, so we don't see it too much, which is not a bad thing. We don't want to have to, you know, overdo these type of effects. But we can also space out the keyframe so it's a little slower. So we could take them, uh, let's say hold down Alt and grab the last keyframe and drag it, and that actually makes um, the animation a little bit longer. So depending on if you want it to be slow or fast, uh, you know, just play around with that. So I like it a little faster myself. Yeah, so I actually like it when it's a little bit faster. And we can even duplicate the two layers and maybe offset one so we get kind of like a dual shock wave. Um, maybe one's fast and the other one's a little bit slower. Just be careful, I'll, I'm turning the opacity up so that we can see it, but you know, you might even turn it up and then fade it out once it's filled the screen so that uh, you don't have to worry about the mask being perfect. So that's kind of a nice, a nice effect. Now, it gets better. So we can look at this, again, let's take a look at this without our footage so that we can just kind of see. Another thing we can do is create another type of shockwave, and this is more of like a spherical shockwave. So if we create uh, a solid, we can add a fractal noise. Uh, let's see here, effect, effect uh, noise, fractal noise. And then we can add a uh, sphere effect. So we could do uh, sphere, um, and we should be able to find CC sphere, drop that on there. 
and it creates a nice uh, sphere effect. So if we go into the shading, we'll, uh, we'll turn the diffuse down and the ambient up and the specular down. So we just create um, a perfect sphere and then we'll choose effect, transition and linear wipe should be in there. And what I'm going to do actually is put the linear wipe before the sphere effect and let's set this to zero and I'm going to turn up the transition completion. So here we're creating a slice of the sphere and uh, we'll feather it out. And I'm going to duplicate that and we're actually going to do the same thing but we're going to set this to 180. And then we're going to just cut the top off a little bit and feather that a little bit more. And so then if I come down to the sphere I can rotate this a touch. Let's see. Rotate it so, I'm going to exaggerate this so you can see. I'm going to rotate it so that it looks like it's got some 3D to it. And then I also want to make sure I'm careful about the size of the noise. If we scale, see, see I, can, I can create a really sharp seam or I can move it so that it's, you know, kind of invisible. And we could do some tiling and things like that, but that's just a simple way to work that out. And we can play with the contrast and, and, and stuff like that. We'll set the transfer mode to add, just so we can see it and we can tweak it a little bit later. And I also like to do um, a few things to make it look more three-dimensional. So we'll come over to the rotation and the idea is to simply animate the radius down from zero up to like a gazillion so that it like fills the frame. Um, so we've got the two keyframes and this cool little circular shockwave. Now we can do something else that's interesting. We can animate the rotation of this. So let's say um, we take that off, keyframe the rotation so that it spins really fast. So then as we scale it from nothing up to uh, a lot, what we get is a little bit more of a 3D look. So we might even add that rotation and make it even more extreme so that it really, um, you know, really becomes noticeable. And it just makes it look a little bit more um, 3D. So we'll, we'll rotate this down a little bit and that looks good. So then we can move the position of, uh, of the sphere. We can slide it over here so that it radiates from our explosion. And then if we take this layer, what we may need to do um, is scale it up, but let's just parent it to our explosion. And um, let's see, we'll just move the layer over. Maybe lower the opacity, rotate it a little bit there. So we can play around with the timing of this, but let's just take a look. It's a little bit more Halo-like, but it's an interesting effect. And the way I actually just like to use it is really trimmed down so that it doesn't look really large, but just kind of a like a low-level kind of shockwave. But it just gives it a almost a little bit of 3D depth. As, uh, as it kind of blasts off there. So it's up to you, you can kind of play with how that looks, but not too bad. In fact, here I have this other comp that I was going to show you of this desert type of explosion using all the same stuff. And this is actually kind of this little underground kind of light charge that was just a fractal noise, but uh, let's take a look. So we see um, the dust picking up and then you see this big shock wave coming at us and then the dirt and the dust kind of picks up and fills the frame at the end. So it's all the same stuff. There's no camera shake so that I wanted you to be able to see um, what was happening without trying to, you know, hide it in the camera shake, which is something compositors never do. It wouldn't be right. It's up to us to make things perfect. Right. Um, Okay, now the final thing would be to make sure that you are in front of all of this dust. And so what you could do is duplicate the footage, put it on top, and then roto it out. You know, you could use uh, the pen tool, 
draw a shape around everything. This takes forever. Hit M, set a keyframe for the path. And essentially, you kind of have to just kind of go frame by frame and, um, and do that. And what happens, and then you feather it. And so then when the shockwave goes off, the shockwave will be behind you and it will look, it'll look a, lot, uh, a lot better. Now in this case, so here you can see the shockwave actually is behind me and it's subtle, but your mind kind of picks up on the fact that that's behind it and just, you know, looks a little bit nicer. So that's how you would roto it. By the way, we should probably turn the motion blur on for all of these. And uh, I would say it looks pretty good. I mean, a little bit, uh, turn that motion blur on for all of uh, the layers and, uh, you know, probably add some glow in there just to make it a really, really bright explosion. And uh, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty close. So here is, uh, again, here is the example from the beginning. You know, you might actually explore the After Effects CS5 Roto Brush. Um, probably a cool solution for just creating a quick garbage mask um, that will just separate you from the dust elements, but it doesn't have to be perfect because um, I'm sure this shot with all the motion blur and, um, you know, the color might be a little bit difficult, but probably work for, uh, for some cases and then just have smoke fill the frame. That's the key. Just cover everything up, make it go to black, and, uh, and you're done. Say, I'm out of here, taking the rest of the day off. I hope this tutorial has been helpful. You know, I, I thought I would just get in there and just show you what it's like to be compositing. You know, you're just tweaking things and changing settings. It's not always a perfect recipe or specific steps to get something to look right. It's about how it feels and how it looks, and you just have to, uh, you know, tweak it a little bit. So. Hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial and be sure to check out the forum and our blog, our blog especially. We have a lot of things going on there um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So I'm Andrew Kramer. We'll see you next time.